Holland, I have never been this excited to host a podcast. And <laughs> all right, good, good. Well, you know, I haven't had anyone on this podcast as a guest who was an employee at this company. And I've been trying to find these thought leaders around the industry or outside the industry who really have unique perspectives. And yet all along, there's been a true thought leader right inside of our company that I have failed to interview. And that is you. And when it hit me, I haven't interviewed Colin. It was such an obvious choice, but you are the first snappy cracking employee. And I thank you so much for coming on this podcast. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm I'm definitely honored. Um, I mean, there's a lot of really incredible people at this organization at Snappy Kraken. So um, to be the first is definitely an honor. And I really hope up to live up to expectations. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, if you don't, then no other employee will ever get to do this. <laughs> uh, but but if you crush it, then we'll we'll have other of those great people at this organization come on the podcast too. Yeah, yeah, I like it. <laughs> so it, it's it's all on your shoulders, man. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, well. Look, let, let, let me just tell the audience for a minute why I'm so excited to have Colin here and why you should listen to him and why this is relevant for financial advisors. So Colin is actually a bit of a, a celebrity in his own community and in his own right um, when it comes to developing culture at companies. And everyone asks me all the time, like after we hosted the Jolt Conference and they engage with our employees, they all ask me, where do you get your great people? How do you find so many great people? All your employees are so amazing. How do you find them? And the answer is really, Colin is our talent acquisition manager at Snappy Kraken. He goes out and, and helps us find these people. And he does it a lot of really interesting ways that advisors can learn from. And he also spearheads our culture team. And I will say Colin has written the book on culture. <laughs> Literally, uh, he wrote an incredible book. We're going to talk about it. Culture of excellence, what we can learn from the Yankees about leadership. So if you're a sports fan, if you care about culture, Colin is definitely your man. So uh, Colin, let's go ahead and dive right in. Um, I, I want to ask you right away, what is it about company culture that you're so passionate about? Because it just oozes out of you. Why are you so passionate about this? Yeah, great question. And I really think it's two things. Um, the first thing is I just want, so culture, like when I, when I really try to just break it down as simply as I can for people, it's just really the experiences you have with the people you're surrounded by. And I wrote that in the book. And so like selfishly, if I'm part of a culture, I want to have the best experience possible right um and so uh that that's really the the biggest thing i think that stands out initially um but when it when i dive deeper into it and this was the basis of the book like if you look at the, the back cover i'm so interested in <laughs> right there <laughs> i'm so interested right at that top line how leadership and culture affect the performance of a team and not just sports teams but organizations like our snappy Kraken or fortune 500 companies um it's it's objectively much harder to quantify things when it comes to like culture perspective like when you're talking about soft skills and um, all those different things but my intuition was to say it matters a whole lot <laughs> and when i wrote the book i came to the conclusion that yes it, it does matter a whole lot and so like it matters, it makes a difference in how companies and how teams, no matter the industry you're in, go about it can really make or break the, I, I use the term excellence instead of success um, yeah. that you have. I agree. But Colin, I'm going to also challenge you like over the last, I don't know, decade or so. And you talk about this in the book too, but like culture's become a buzzword basically. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's like culture, 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 got to have a great culture. But like, I don't even know if people really know what that means. And and you said something so important. You said it impacts success. I mean, it is true. A great culture, a culture of excellence leads to success. A bad culture leads to failure. There's no doubt about it. But really, like, what is culture? I mean, people talk about it, but how do you define it? What are the components of it? What makes a culture great? Yeah. Um, so it's really those experiences that I talked about earlier. But if you break it down more... Uh, it's it's the leadership. So it's the people who um, 
you know, really influence all the decisions that are being made, the the work ethic, the attitude that you can have at work. That's a huge piece of everything. And that leadership can extend to, it can be the executive team, it can be middle management, it can be just a, a, an average employee. Um, it, it goes across the board. Um, so there's definitely that piece of it in terms of like, what what it actually is culture is definitely leadership like that that is encompassed um within it uh and, and i and i think like um i mean there's so so many <laughs> so many different examples of it but uh when when i really think about the best cultures i think about teams or i think about companies like you said who've experienced success and i think the argument can be made that like you can find success um, when you when you have just really talented people from a technical standpoint or from a skill standpoint. Um, and, and there have been sports teams and there have been companies that have um, done really well. But when you talk about sustainable success, like that's the other piece of it too. And I think it really starts with that leadership. Like that's when you can really start to build that footprint to say like, okay, we understand who we are as a company. We understand what we're what we're going after. So like define those things and then you can start moving toward that. But if you don't have the right leadership in place and that's like the whole basis of like why I started my book because the Yankees are the toxicity of baseball when the book starts and you can't find that sustainable success. So like that's the other huge piece to me. It's like it's one thing to have a, a really great culture for a season or for a year and like win some cool awards or win a championship. But when you try to do it year after year and you have the inevitable turnover and you have competing priorities between people and departments and, you know, just different things pop up um, COVID and, and whatnot, like all of it becomes really difficult. But if you have really great leaders, they can help you stay focused on what is most important and when you define that, like, that's how you can say, okay, this is what my culture is. And your culture is going to be different from company to company or to team to team. Like, I truly believe that. Um, but there are a lot of things that, you know, like we talk about mindset, attitude, work ethic, and that leadership overall that are really going to affect the culture. It's a great way to describe it. And I agree wholeheartedly with everything you said. When you look at the financial advisors that we serve, you know, they do span the whole gamut of business structure. Some are very big companies. They have executive teams and, and large middle management teams and, and hundreds of employees. But by and large, most financial advisors out there are small teams. Mm -hmm. Usually the advisor is the leader and they have one assistant or a small team of three to five. Maybe as they grow, they bring in another advisor or two and they're the leadership team. But you know, they're... They're specialists in financial planning and 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 not always in business. Uh, often they're really great at their craft, but not always at scaling up a business or scaling a culture. And so if you're dealing with a smaller organization, it's all even hard to almost call it an organization, right? We'll just say there's a small team, there's a few people, and there's this one alpha leader specialist at the top who's trying to serve their clients and build an organization and a culture. Like how, how do they go about that? What would you, yeah. where, where do you start? <laughs> yeah, that that's a great question. And I really believe that it starts with relationships. And so you'd have to imagine that this financial advisor has some aptitude toward building relationships. If they built a book of business to, be able to have a small team underneath them in the first place, right? And so now it's like taking that approach that you take with your clients, with your members, with your people, and doing it with that small team that you talked about. And understanding like, you can't do everything. Um, no one's expecting you to do everything. So by building relationships, you're going to find out where other people have strengths in areas that you may either struggle with or you just simply don't like to do, then you can start delegating that work. Uh, building relationships, I, I just feel like if you're looking for that place to start, like that's that's really it. Because if if you're if you're not going to take the time to build the your you're not going to take the time to build relationships with three to five people, those three to five people aren't going to stick around. 
like it, it's um it's already hard enough in a lot of those cases i feel like to to attract really great workers and to attract really great talent because you can't always pay them as much or there's not great benefits because you are a smaller company you know things like that and so if they don't feel valued if they don't feel like they have growth opportunities if they don't feel like they can learn anything from you if if you can't you can't just be someone who builds book of business and passes it along. You have to have the ability to take those relationships and then learn how to coach, learn how to teach, learn how to delegate the right way, all those different things. So I think really simply build those relationships and build off of that. That is so wise. And, you know, actually, as, as I listened to you, you just defined one of the greatest missing ingredients because there's a lot of advice out there for how to build a business and how to build a culture, but it doesn't always apply to smaller businesses and practitioners. But, but I think the essence of what you just said, if they're not going to stick around because there's career paths, they're not going to stick around because the benefits and the pay are amazing. They're going to stick around because of the relationship. Mm -hmm. They're going to stick around because they're loyal to you. So if you don't treat them well and make them feel like, they are really important to you and coach them. So they're still growing, even if they're not growing in title or growing necessarily in big leaps in pay, they can be growing professionally, cultivating skills. If you don't do that, then they have nothing. They have no reason to stay. And then you can never really build a business. You can't ever scale past that. Right. So, I mean, you just, you, you nailed it. And I hadn't thought about it that way before, uh, Colin, but it's excellent. You know, uh, it makes me think about something in your book, actually, that I flagged. Uh, you know, when I go on podcasts and people read my book to me, I hate it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to do it to you. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's an excerpt from chapter five uh, on page, uh, page 93, and it's about player-led teams. And it hit me right between the eyes. Here's what it said. Studies all over the world show that player-led teams almost always outperform coach-led ones. Why? Player-led teams take responsibility and ownership for the pulse of the entire culture in addition to each individual being concerned with their own development and accomplishments. Cultures like this have players who are empowered and self-aware. These types of groups realize that at the end of the day, it is their team and the success and failure of the team are more affected by the performances of the players than by the coaches and managers. That's not to say that coaches and managers are exempt from responsibility. They should be willing participants when it comes to culture building. But any manager or coach will admit that it's much easier to do their job when the players can police themselves. Now, when I read this, it hit me for two reasons. One is because this is what I want at Snappy Crack and what we're trying to develop. So later I'm going to be asking you how we're doing, Colin. We'll have a side conversation. How are we doing? Okay. How can we do this better? This is exactly what I want. But that's not relevant to our audience. What is, is that financial advisors did not get into this business because they wanted to be CEOs, usually. They got into this business because they love to help people and be financial planners and do the work and connect with their clients. So this right here to me is the holy grail for an advisor to have a player led team where they don't have to worry about all the nuances of running a business day to day. They don't have to worry about the paperwork they don't want to do. They don't have to worry about getting prepped for meetings because everybody is doing that for them and they can show up and shine. Mm -hmm. That's what they want. So now we're going to think back to our example before you talked about the relationship. You talked about being a coach, but, this could be almost counterintuitive to say, well, now we want player-led teams, not coach-led teams. How does this harmonize? And how can small organizations achieve this? Yeah, I talk about this all the time with my wife because I think it's probably the single hardest thing that organizations outside of sports struggle with. Like they, it, In sports, the goal is super clear. And when the goal is really clear, it's also very clear, like most of the time, how your role fits into that, right? So like if you're a baseball player and you're part of that starting nine, you know exactly what it is that you're doing to win that game. Like it is, it is just crystal clear. Baseball has been around for 150 years. The purpose, the outcome, it's all there. In a lot of businesses, corporate organizations, whatever it is, the goal is not as clear. The 
the, the money part is usually known, right? Like the bottom line is important. Most people know that. But what they're trying to accomplish isn't quite as clear. And when that's not clear, then the roles and responsibilities and like what your work is actually affecting isn't as clear. So if like we go back to our example, and in theory, this should be a little bit easier, right? Because it's a smaller team. Um, and so there, there's less spreading of the responsibilities. There's more visibility as a result. And when it comes to financial advisors, I mean, the, the purpose is pretty clear already, right? We're, we're here to uh, help people or financial advisors are here to help people with their, their money, whether that's retirement. Uh, whether that's investments, there's there's a whole gambit of different things. Um, and so the purpose is usually already pretty clear. And so they I think I think financial advisors have an advantage, just like sports teams do, where they can say like, okay, there's not much variation with what the outcome is going to be. Now let's take those three to five people on our team and let's really make sure that not only they have definable job descriptions that they understand and they know and they feel like they're in their zone of genius but they know what their job does to affect that outcome like that that's always the key part that like a lot of times I feel like is missing even within the sports teams like when I had the, the leadership academy and um, you know I'm working with high school teams and, and college teams um, you know professionals are, are a different animal right like they're professionals for a reason but when when you work with high school and college athletes, like sometimes the, the positioning gets in, it gets in the way of what the goal is. And so there, there's always going to be those challenges, but um, you know, I think there is that advantage. Like I said, with financial advisors, the purpose is already pretty clear for the industry. And so take that and make sure that your people know how the work that they are doing is affecting the, uh, the goal that you have for success or for excellence. I want to summarize what you just said to make sure I really understand it. So if you want this, if you want your people leading in their roles so that you have the freedom to focus where you love, you must spend the time up front to create a clear vision, a clear goal, clearly defined responsibilities, clearly define who is responsible for what, put that in their job description, make the outcomes you expect from them plain so that they are pulling in the same direction as you in the direction you want, but don't need constant guidance from you. Yeah. Cause that's where, if you have all that, that's where the pick me ups come in. Right. So, and that's, that's the players in the case of the book or um, the people, the financial advisors in, in the case of our audience saying that if I miss an assignment or if I don't come through, I'm human, right? Like I'm going to fail. I'm going to mess up. But if it's a player led team and everybody understands what their responsibility is, they can pick that person up. Right. And there, and there's less reliance on the leader of the organization to try to like pick up the pieces all the time, you know, and everything. And, and like, so often you need those people to be the ones who make that adjustment in real time. You can't wait for it to go up the ladder and then come back and get an answer and then go try and execute. Like a lot of times that the execution needs to happen in real time. There needs to be that awareness and that adjustment. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's where you can connect those two things is to say, like, when you have those outcomes that you just summarized and outlined, then the, the reason it can be player led in the case of the book is because the pick me up can be there. People can, people can help out when needed and the, and the train's not going to stop moving. You're going to keep moving forward. Yeah, I I absolutely agree. You know, I, I've worked with over 6,000 advisors. I mean, probably in the course of my career, probably over 10,000. And what I've seen time and time again is the advisor gets into business to be an advisor. They start to need help. They start hiring people. They start telling the people what to do. Mm-hmm. The people start coming to them for the answers. They start spending all their time telling people what to do and then answering questions. And they can never grow past a certain level because instead of empowering people to help them grow, they end up being beholden to that system where they are the imparter of the knowledge. They are the gatekeeper of all the insight and wisdom and responsibility. And these people are just helpers. 
but you can't really effectively manage too many helpers. And then people who are helpers, they feel like they're just helpers <laughs> right. and that gets old, that gets old pretty soon. Then they just go find other jobs and then they have turnover and, and they get stuck. I can't even tell you how many advisors I know. It's like an advisor, a few assistants, and that's the cap because they don't do exactly what you just described. So solid, solid advice, by the way, anybody, if, if you are not listening to this and going like, wow, like Colin's amazing. And I need to learn more. I, I don't know what's wrong with you, but, um, <laughs> but this is his book. All right. Culture of excellence, like go buy the book on Amazon. Uh, Colin, you've, you've taught me a lot just in the short time we've talked and I've learned a lot more from you just by watching you work, uh, here and what you've done for us. And I do want to say thank you publicly. Uh, but for this podcast, I also want to shift gears okay. a little bit because you're not just uh, an amazing champion of culture. You are also uh, quite a marketer. You've got your own podcast going. Uh, two, actually, a few of them, right? Two Jocks and a Schlub, Dynamic Leaders podcast, and then you've got your own like new personal brand thing going with Cernig. Yeah. Uh, so I, I want to see what advisors can learn from you about podcasting today. <laughs> uh, so so t give me uh, give me some cliff notes here, like you're going to start a podcast. You want to, what should you expect? Um, I don't know what to do for mics and equipment and like, where should I start? And just give me a primer here, Colin, how are you doing all this? How are you running three podcasts and doing a full-time job and raising a kid? Like what's, how you, what's, what's the miracle here? <laughs> Flexibility. <laughs> that That's the miracle for sure. Um, <laughs> when I first started podcasting, it was back in 2018 and I was I was a slow adopter to podcasts. Um, I, they they were definitely a thing by then, and I hadn't even started listening until probably you know six months or so before I started my own podcast. Um, but I knew when I started listening to different podcasts, and I realized how many uh, learning um, resources were out there, how many sports podcasts were out there for the sports nerd and me, uh, and different things like that. I was like, I want to know more, and um, you know, I had the the Leadership Academy and you had mentioned Dynamic Leaders and that was the first podcast I ever did. And it was, it, I think I overthought everything, right? Um, I, I thought overthought everything. And if I like could go back now and, and give my past self some advice or give anyone who's thinking about starting a podcast some advice, uh, really, you don't need super fancy equipment. Um I mean, obviously, I think the more expensive it is, maybe the better sound quality you're going to get and all those type of things. But all I've ever used is a microphone and my laptop. And um, and through the the different podcast mediums, I've been able to connect with leaders at huge organizations, professional sports athletes, like people, people that I've admired from afar that I never thought I was going to be able to even have 20 seconds with much less 20 minutes or an hour with, um, and, and just learned so much from them. Um, and it was all because I invested $35 into a, into a microphone and said, okay, I'm going to be consistent with this. I'm going to do it week to week. I'm going to utilize my talent acquisition skills in terms of, um, what we call sourcing in the industry, uh, and being able to reach out to people cold, uh, and try to, start to build those relationships and get people comfortable with coming on and show them value and everything. And, you know, I think that that was um, an advantage I had. I had done a ton of interviews. A lot of people are um, not quote unquote professionally trained to do interviews um, and, and they may be intimidated by that. Um, they don't know how to find guests. They may be intimidated by that. Um, but even if you do a solo podcast or if you, if you do a podcast with guests, like there are resources out there to, work on your public speaking to get more comfortable with it. But the biggest thing for me was just to do it, to be consistent, to try to get as many quality guests as I could to build my my credibility. And I really parlayed that. I mean, I was an amateur podcaster, indie podcaster, however you want to classify it. And then in last year in 2021, um, through a relationship I had built, um, partially in podcasting and then partially in my book research, I got an opportunity to get a contract with the Blue Wire Podcasting Network. Um, and they took they took Dynamic Leaders. They took um, this silly podcast I do with two of my best friends from uh, grade school. And uh, they made us professional podcasters that get paid for what we do. We don't get paid a ton of money, but um, you know it's, it's just really cool. So I think it's just uh, the other reminder is just patience. You know, I, I mentioned I started back in 2018. I didn't 
not everybody wants to be a professional podcaster. And I, I'm positive you can make money on your own, um, you know, through indie podcasting. But if you enjoy it, if you have a, a topic that you're passionate about, like, it's pretty endless, you know, like, that's why you keep doing it Robert like you're you're really passionate about it and you put out really great content like it makes it easy in some ways to you know get up and do it and um you know just knowing that you're you're providing value for people that's that's a real great thing about it too yeah that's a great lesson you you know it's it's discouraging sometimes when you don't have a lot of listeners and and you just touched on two things though that can keep you going and I think that's what anybody who's thinking about this needs to you know have that perspective because if you're going to this like, oh, how many listeners do I have? Why isn't my listener account larger? Uh, why isn't my listener account going up faster? Why aren't I getting leads off my podcast? Um, that's really not going to be motivating because it does take a while. That's why you said patience is needed. But yeah. but if you focus on the relationships you get to build, which is super cool, by the way. I mean, you're right. You, you talk to people, you learn. Like it's a learning experience. You're You're finding people you admire. You're asking them questions. You're learning from them. That's a fun interaction. So if you like people, that's killer. That's one of the things that motivates me. And then the other thing is, you know, you're delivering value. People are going to listen and get value. And if you remember that, it doesn't matter if it's 10 people that listen and get value or 10,000, you are delivering value. So you're benefiting and you're benefiting others. And that's super motivating. $35 and a little practice, right? That's it. I'm using that same mic today. Yeah, (laughs) I love it. That's great. Yeah, congrats on getting paid on your podcast. Um, (laughs) Thank you. Okay, so uh, Colin, th- there is one more thing I just want to touch on. It's it's not related to podcasting. I should ask you this before because I'm going back to culture a little bit, but there's okay. a lot of companies downsizing right now mm-hmm. um, in the environment that's out there, which I think means it's a great opportunity to pick up talent while you are uh, in this environment. If you If you want great talent, it's out there. There's a lot of people losing jobs. Um, but a lot of them are losing jobs at big companies. And they had maybe inflated pay or inflated titles. Um, And for the advisors who are listening, if if they want to have an edge to go out there and recruit some top talent right now, even though they're small, uh, what are a few recommendations you could make for them to kind of get that rolling? Um, Most advisors probably just slap job ads up on Monster. Like, that's it. See what they get. But I know there's better ways. Um, If you're a small organization, you want to attract top talent. What are a few takeaways you could leave for our audience? Yeah, absolutely. I think regardless of the economic situation or the business situation that you're in, taking a warm approach to your recruiting can pay dividends no matter when it happens. Um, And and this is something we do at Snappy Crack and we have our talent community. It was something I, I really wanted to get going as soon as I started here last July. And it is an opportunity to start building baseline relationships with people so that if and when you have job opportunities that open up, you've already established that baseline and then you can reach out to them. You can gauge their interest. Timing is everything, obviously, but um, you know, it's, it's much, it's much easier to start with some established relationships than it is to do what you mentioned, Robert, and just put things out on Indeed or Monster. I mean, the job boards are, are great and they're useful, but you're relying on the great talent finding you when you can take the efforts and make the time to go find the great talent. Uh, And and there's obviously the fundamental difference there, right? And so taking time to do it, it doesn't need to be a lot of time. I mean, from week to week with me, it's usually half hour to an hour. um, The amount of people who sign up for our talent community and book a 20 minute call with me. Uh, And it's happened before. It'll happen again in the future where through these conversations, we will hire somebody. <laughs> uh, and, and so it makes it worth it. You know, it, it's, it's, um, that's the value you can provide going back to what we were talking about with podcasting. Like if you set up your own little town community or call it whatever you want, the value you can provide in spending that 20 minutes with somebody is potentially giving them a job down the road. Or if you can't give them a job, a lot of things, a lot of times, like what I try to do is just connect them with other people who may have opportunities. Um, that's what somebody did for me. It's actually how I ended up at Snappy Kraken. And so I try to give back in that way a lot too. And I think that's something that pretty much everyone can do. Everyone's got a network, everyone's got connections. So, um, you know, I know a lot of times we can't just wave a magic wand and create a job, but there are a lot of job opportunities out there. And so I do try to connect people, but, but yeah, take, take those warm relationships 
um, use them to your advantage. And, and I think that's a really great way. And, and it's a cost saving way too. You don't have to really spend any money <laughs> um, to do that on job boards and postings and things like that. Like that's just, you know, if you're going to a network event or something like that you get the business card follow up on it like have the phone call make the connection you never know where it can lead to yeah always be recruiting even if you're not hiring <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes it is great advice it's keeping in touch with people treating them well looking for talent uh people who have an eye for talent have a have a massive advantage and if you can train yourself to be on the lookout like hey that person's sharp that person's skilled that i would love to have that person in my organization and you start that dialogue it, it, yeah you're right even if it doesn't happen for a year or down yeah. the road so it's super super smart mm -hmm. well colin I've, I've enjoyed this immensely we are lucky to have you at snappy kraken we've been very fortunate to have you on this podcast today as well you know the title of the podcast is steal my strategy you've given us a lot of things to steal but we want the one all right so everybody's going to walk away from this they're going to say hey i learned a lot from colin but the most important thing he taught me was what I would say the most important thing of all of this is your people. So the quality of your people matters the most of anything else. Like if you don't have people who match your core values, then you don't have the culture that you're trying to build. Like that, that's exactly how you can start this right after this podcast. Look at your company, look at your core values. If you don't have core values, establish them and then use that to that. That's a way that it, it's not a hard quantification, but that's a way that you can try to qualify some of those soft skills with your people and understand, are they a fit? And when you're recruiting for new people, don't sacrifice that quality. Keep the quality bar high and you should find you should find that you can build that sustainable culture that we talked about. Well, that is great advice. It's a great thought to leave with. Colin, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Robert. I really appreciate the opportunity.